we feel real honored to have her here today. So let's give a big round of applause. Thank you. Anyway, so you want to learn as a speaker who's your audience, what your, pres what your positioning is. As a keynote speaker, it's the single best thing that you can do because you're there and you always stay all the time. You stay the entire day of a session or you stay at the conference. Why? Because you're going to smooge, you'll be able to pick up other business, and you'll sell a ton of books. In the contracts, and when we do the speaking workshop we'll do for you later, I will give you a copy of my contract because I spent several thousand dollars putting it together. Why should you respend it? You can just copy and rip it off. It's fine with me. So. Um, what you want to do is you, add, you have to have in your requirement and your fee very specifically that you have a designated table, a designated table. Sometimes they will only allow you to do it in the room, so you have to be very slick on that. But what we try to go through is out in a general registration area. John travels with me quite often. Um, when I was out this, I made a very specific decision four years ago to get off the road because in, this, the, in the speaking business, March, April, May, huge months, I was healthcare really in healthcare, um, and September, October, mid-November, and then it died, just bang, is dead till the, you know, till you go into the next year. And I could be in 13 states per month during those months. You're talking about a giant beat up on your body, giant beat up on your body. So I made a decision four years ago, I'm done. I'm really done. I'm going to do what I really love, which is publishing and showing people about publishing, which I've been doing since the mid 80s when I started waking up and figuring out how to do it all. So um, you can make a very lucrative reading, and I'm going to take you to the platform where I will show you exactly to the dollar how much money I made speaking from 1987 through 2010. I'm going to show you exactly how much I made in royalties from New York Publishing. I'm going to show you exactly how much I made selling books on my own. I'm going to show you exactly how much I made where people said, you know, we really like you and we want you to be our spokesperson. I'm going to reveal all that and I'm going to tell you over $4 million came in. You can make a living with your mouth, but it requires a strategic plan. All right, and that's what we're going to get into creating your platform. How do you create that platform? and do with that. And I don't care if you have children's books. I don't care if you're going to goal is you're in the scientific side and you're going out across the global world. Um, I, I, I don't care what kind of book is. There is a market for it. And you can absolutely, if you will niche yourself, the more you funnel, funnel this baby in, the more expansive your world becomes. Because you become the go-to person. And in healthcare, which I fell into accidentally, because I'm not a nurse, but people thought I was. You know, I'm not an MD, but people thought I was. Because I knew all the jargon, and I could flow in, and I too would find myself standing in line in the grocery store, looking at people's veins and thinking, good stick. I'm telling you, it's, you there is an evolution that happens when you start blending in with when you find your market. And it's so exciting. To do that. Now, do I still speak to that healthcare market? Well, I'm, when I made a decision to come off the road, I said, I will if they really work hard to come find me. I wouldn't even follow up on phone calls. People said we really wanted to have, I wouldn't even follow up on that. Where in the old days, you, you know, I was boy on that because that was our business. But that's not our business anymore. But I did agree to speak to a large nursing association in Canada next year because there was 8,500 reasons why I would. Okay? And I will sell at that conference a minimum of 500 books. A minimum of 500 books. They've already pre-bought 100 committed to that. So coming back to how Tom started this, I want to know what the gig is. Are people flying in to be there? Because if they're flying in, that means the credit cards are out. You see, if you, if you, those of you who are going to go into corporate side, the, the credit cards are not out. They don't even bring their wallets to hear you. And you can rock and roll. So how do you get around that trick? Always ask if there is payroll deduction. If there's payroll deduction, all they do is spell out their little payroll ID, and it's like a credit card. It's so exciting. 
So there's just little things that you'll learn as you go along. But speaking, what's the time of day? If you have an engagement in the evening, you could rock and roll. I mean, you, you could bring down the house and you'll hardly sell any books because they just want to go home. You know, you sent them out the door feeling fabulous, but they just want to go home. You'll sell very few. So your best positioning is in the morning hours, best positioning in an all-day conference. Best positioning is having them out there so people can visually see them. So those 750 people that are floating around, not everyone goes into the bookstore. You want to have them do so you can be there to schmooze and say, what's the problem? Let me brainstorm with you if I can give you a couple of solutions to it. And you become the hero and they take you home. So it's much better to go that way. Now, when we go through here, um, and you will not have all the slides. You know, I'm sitting with many more slides than you are. But you're going to have the core, and I expect you to write. There's plenty of paper on that. So the basic thing is that here we are on, on is there a book in you? And 80% of the population. So let me just give you an introduction of who I am. And it, actually, I'm I have 30 books. The 30th book is just coming out. Um, we're in layout right now. It's called Author U, Y-O-U, Creating and Developing the Author and Book Platforms. Um, and that's going to be, it's a four color, it's very jazzy with that. I've sold over a million copies. I've had over four million dollars in revenues based on my books um, that have come out. I've been on everything from Oprah and featured in the National Enquirer. That, and that, that was from a Newsweek cover story. All right, I've published in 16 countries. I've done 18 of the 30 books with traditional publishers. Would I publish with New York again? And then I created my own imprint in 2000. How that happened is that a, a client who I was speaking for in Bellevue, Washington, called me and said, we're really looking forward to having you come. And by the way, could you talk to the publisher? Because we'd like to be able to get some of your books. Do you think you can you know, get them to discount a little bit? And, and I knew what book they were talking about. And inside, the dialogue is starting on me because I had just taken back the rights of the book. So I didn't know how many books they were talking about. And by the way, what we would like to have is 1,000 books. Now, for an author, heart be still when someone says, I'd like to have 1,000 copies of your book. And I immediately had a discussion with the plant in the corner of my office because now I have taken over and I am going to become a publisher. And hadn't thought about that because I was going to resell the book. But I had to make a decision because, you see, this gig was in four months. And I knew publishing, traditional publishing is, you're talking a year and a half plus. So I knew, I, and I didn't know what to do, but I said yes. So I said, I think I can arrange that. And I knew that I had to do major rewrites on this book that they wanted. And, um, and I had to really figure out how to do it. Really figure out how to do it. Now, did I make some mistakes? Sure. The printing costs were way too high, but I was able to negotiate enough money out of them to cover 2,000 books. That's how Mile High Press started. And we started putting it together. So would I publish with New York again? The answer is yes. If they offered me so much frickin' money, I wouldn't care how they'd screw it up. <laughs> and that's a bottom line. Because there, I, there is very few on, on a hand of authors I've known who published with New York who have said it has been the most exciting, accelerating, positive, fabulous experience they've ever had in their life. Most authors grumble. They're not happy. They hate the cover. They don't like look, look like. There was no interaction. They abandoned me, which is usually the typical thing. New York will abandon you in about within a month. And they practice what we call Velcro publishing. And they come out with the publish, they do it, and whatever sticks, if it sticks, if you, dear author, do all the work to market it, to drive the people to the bookstore, if you will do all that work, we will continue to publish it. Otherwise, and it's a shock. It's, it's, it, that, is, that is the reality of today's marketplace. So 18 were with New York, 12 have been on my own. Um, speaking was the single best thing I did to move books out there. Now, when I started down the road, we didn't have the internet. If I had the internet back then, oh boy, would that have been fabulous. So the fabulous thing, for those of you, it doesn't matter if it's fiction or nonfiction, 
the internet is your single best friend. And there are some very significant things that you should be doing and strategizing as soon as you start thinking, there is a book in me. Because you need to start thinking about the development of what you're going to do via the social media platforms. All right, now, my best sale at a conference that like, what Tom was talking about, that he was at, that I did a session. I was a, um, um, an afternoon session. And I started breaking the rules. It was a nursing conference. There was maybe 850 in the audience. I started breaking the rules because they said you can't use that many slides. I had an hour presentation. I used 90 slides. <laughs> I'm a motor mouth. Now, I use a lot of cartoons, and I have quick, 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 quick. I'm going around, and then we would rest, and we do something. I even had some activity, interactivity with that. But you learn how to do those kind of things. After that presentation, over the next, that afternoon and the next day, we sold 16,000 books in a five-hour period. That's 560 books. And my arm hurt. Now, hint for those of you who do go out when you start doing those mass signings, or you, I mean, Tom, what he should be doing when he goes out to his conferences, all his books should be pre-signed, pre-signed. The trick of the trade. Pre-sign your books. Come up with a little saying that you're going to do for, I mean, I've got 30 books. Each one of my books has its own saying. Now, not all 30 are in print now. Each one has its own saying. You pre-sign them, and then you put Linda when Linda buys it. And that way, you can, you can actually have more eye connection and give her a little bit more time when you have a crowd that's buying books than you can when you have to stop and then you have to look down and write all this stuff, all right? So just a little trick to help you there. That isn't real signature. It's not a stamp. No. Oh, no. Do it there. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, so for the money book, you know, if I, I mean, when I have a small group, it's okay. But for a big group, it, they would all be uh, in woman to woman, it was in support. And I, and I stopped putting my last name. I stopped signing my last name. I just put my first name. Okay. So in the future, Mr. Futurist. Okay. All right. So I became a publisher um, and learned a lot. I'm, the book, I'm known as the book shepherd. And actually, the best at, I, at a conference we did, and I, and I do hope you all get involved with it next year because why? Well, there's this, the Bible in publishing is called PW, Publishers Weekly. How many of you have heard of it? PW. The publisher, Tom, I'm really jazzed, he's my keynote for Author You Extravaganza next year. So he's coming out because he's seen what's going on here in Colorado with Author U. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. But anyway, the Book Shepherd, at the Author U extravaganza last May, and it's always the first weekend in May, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So it's third, fourth, and fifth next year. I had everyone write who they were in a Twitter tweet. How can you describe yourself, what your book is, what your expertise is in a Twitter tweet? How many of you can do that? Remember, you got spaces, you get characters. You need to be able to, because when we talk about titles today, you're going to remember the three S's. You've got to be snappy, sassy, and salty. Okay, so you've got to bring that out. So my description for me is Judith Bryles is a blunt, <coughs> butt-kicking book coach and publishing advisor. 80 characters. Get it down, because when you meet people, you need to bring that about and do that. So, founder of Author U, I'm the chief visionary officer. You want to become a master, a master of book marketing. And I'm going to get into the five key points why authors fail. And you have to get this. And the fifth one, and the critical one, is marketing, marketing, marketing. Did you hear me say? marketing. It's critical. If you don't learn how and actively market your book, your passion, your words, your book will fail. Guaranteed. And if you choose to go a traditional publishing route, whether it's a big publisher or a small publisher, the expectation is you will do that. No exceptions. You have to do that. You see, writing your book is only 20% of the work. Sorry to say. It's what you do when it's all over. 
All right, so you have to become a master at that, and I think that's enough. All right, and, and I would encourage, if you don't have my book, show me about book publishing, make sure you get it today. All right, so with that said, is there a book in you? Is there a book in you? And, and you're all here because there is, and it's birthing, and I know Bob is evolving. <laughs> you know, and I'm, I'm seeing the colors, and I'm going to get him up to be into a real book if it kills me. <laughs> I'm all for it. Okay, so we'll get there. So is there a book in you? And you've got this, so why publish on your handout? Why do you publish? And be very clear. All right, so tell me, why are you publishing? Linda, why are you going to try to publish a book? Uh, because I feel like I have a strong voice, and I want it to be heard by nurses. Nursing. So your, your expertise is in the healthcare arena. And, and boy, I can assist you, because I have drilled down deep into it. Ken, why are you writing a book? Because I have knowledge and experience in real estate that would help other people make money. Absolutely. And it'll, so it will put him as an expert in the field. It will make him a go-to person that if CNN needs an expert on, on that, he is going to know how to pitch himself because he's sassy, snappy, and salty, and he's going to get a producer's attention. Got it? All right. And your name again? I can't see. Uh, you don't have a name. No. Well, what's that about? <laughs> Tell me your name again. Uh, Tony. Tony, all right, why are we publishing? Because uh, I think that I have something to say and I really like to write and I want to make a living. All right, and are you fiction or nonfiction? Fiction. And fiction. All right, the internet is such a rock and roll friend for him because there are so many amazing things that he can do to tweak and tease and launch a book. One of my clients, one of my dear friends, one of my board members for Author U just sold 15,000 copies of her book <laughs> on Amazon. Is this not exciting? In one day. Okay, exciting, exciting, and it's fiction, women's fiction. Roger, why are we publishing? Publishing for uh, two reasons. One, positioning as an expert uh, because we've developed a new approach to practicing law. And Fabulous. And two, because I want to be able to take that approach and market it online with programs, seminars, and uh -huh. And your specialty in law is? Business law. Business law. So, and, and so how many people would like to go to their deathbed with a lawyer at their side? Yeah. Daryl will. But most people, mo there are huge jokes about lawyers, aren't they? Huge, huge jokes about lawyers. So he's got, they funny. and they're not, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're funny. Well, it depends on which side of the joke you're on, right, Roger? So, but the thing is that um, he has an opportunity to open a window because lawyers are often at the butt of a joke. They're often mistrusted. They're often, I mean, it doesn't matter if they give you screwed up information or not, you still have to pay them. It's, it's an amazing business. Okay, Philip, why are we writing? Um, the act of writing helps me organize my thoughts. It helps me, I mean, I've got a lot of ideas, mm -hmm. and a lot of different sort of trains of thought. Okay. And the process of writing helps me organize those and get them down in sort of a, a good order that makes sense. To me. So when we have a book, what are we going to do with it? Uh, when we have a book, what are we going to do with it? I well, guess I mean, yeah. it's, it's elementary. We're going to try to publish it. Okay. But w will it position you as an expert in something? Or uh, is it a story? Um, is it fiction. a... I mean, it's, it's, it's fiction. fiction. Okay. Yeah. Right. So, okay. Great. And Paul? I'm not sure I'm interested in publishing at the moment, but I do like writing. <clears throat> okay, so maybe we have some essays coming together. Could be. All right, and what are we going to do with your book? Oh, well, I haven't started writing. I'm just here to see if I can even write. Ah, well, this is not the craft of writing, but that's another issue. But, so, but it would position you maybe more, or is this fiction or nonfiction, you're thinking? Nonfiction. Nonfiction, okay. So you're going to write about other people versus your own expertise yet? Is that what I'm hearing you yes, say? I'm okay. To this. <laughs> All right. Well, if you've got something if, that we're going to talk about titles, because if you've got the right title, it'll draw people in, because these people have got to have a reason why other people are going to come to the party. Sue, you've got children's books. I have a series of writings that help children connect to their own personal power and also to Mother Earth. Okay. We need to we need to be tied to Mother Earth for. So we have kids conscious raising. We have kids conscious raising. I get that. All right, Bob, you're into photography. Actually, actually, no, this was a startup. Uh, my real one is uh, my, the book in me 
is entrepreneurship and how to start and run a business. And I've been doing it for 40 years, so I got a lot to put into it. So basically, that's, that's what I am going to get started. So we need to get that book out. Yeah. And Daryl, what are we going to do with your book? Well, um, it, it's, it will allow me to maintain my position as the leading expert um, in the world in this field. Which is critical. So, and so see how he's positioning himself? I am the leading expert. The leading expert. And one of my books, which we'll, I'll get into when I get in the platform, I became the pioneer in when, why do and why women undermine each other. Okay. So in the healthcare, which is where I ended up lying, it is so toxic. It is so toxic. One of the unwritten rules is nurses eat their young. Yes? Got it. Okay. I don't know that I have a book in here yet. So we're just exploring, all right? Elaine? Um, I, I feel the need for um, good quality books for the young adults, so. Absolutely. And interesting, young adults, though, they read e-books, but parents, and young illustrators, parents, even if they're e-readers, love, love, love e-readers, they prefer to have their kids having hard books. Did you know that? Okay, interesting. Tom and I have had interesting discussions on E versus P. And Brenda? Um, my book will be probably the uh, wife of the CEO of ET3. <laughs> ET3? Okay. <laughs> All right, so you should, do you know anything about the Young President's <laughs> Organization? Okay, there is, it's a very viable, the YPO is a very, very viable, very exclusive, almost cliquish. But there are very, very strong things that you could do within that organization, probably as the wife of CEO, but also on the outside. I mean, you could do workshops on that. That could be a whole, whole area. Well, she's kind of behind the, she's behind the scenes. The wife, she's, she's dealing with pillow talk. Yes? Got it. All right. So I get that. So, and she could have a lot of sassy, salty, spicy stuff. Snappy. That's what I'm afraid of. Ah. <laughs> oh, is that 50 Shades or something? No, 50 Shades. 50 Shades, which is the hottest book out there, is the modern day version of the story of O. But oh, well, the story of O is better written. All right, well, it's, it's spicy. All right, so here we go. So be very clear on why you're going to publish. So be very clear on what's your topic. What is your topic? And one of the problems with a lot of us who are highly creative, who's my highly creative people in this room? And highly creative, is we jump all over the place. We have a topic of the hour that we could write on. And so you have to, and Bob, you do that a little bit too, I know that. Yeah, and so what you have to do is become very myopic and kind of move into this, this is, this is what I'm going to do, before you exhaust it or decide, you know, it's a misfire doesn't fit. So know what your topic is. And this is imperative. Who are you writing for? If you, and if you tell me that I'm writing for everybody, you are destined to fail. <laughs> destined to fail. Don't even start down the path. Who are you writing for? Linda's in healthcare. I get that. All right. It's a pretty big nurses. Nurses. Just nurses. nurses. Okay, so she's got a few million that she can go for. And when you start telling nurse stories and you do those kind of things, you get involved in it, it makes a huge difference with that. So who's your crowd? Why are you creating writing the book? This is all going to get, we're going to get into book mapping here. What are you willing to invest? Oh, this is huge. What are you willing to invest? Now, that means time, that means energy, and that means bucks. And when people come in to see me, says, you know, I only have a few hundred dollars, number one, you can't afford me. You can't afford me. And you have to all have to. If I need to have a business plan and I'm going in to see a lawyer, I know that I'm going to be dropping a couple of thousand dollars. Is that right, Roger? We can, we can start a little lower. Okay. But I know I could buy this, the things that I get involved in. All right. I, but I'm not, gonna, I'm not going in there for $50. I'm not going in for 100 I'm not going in for 200. I better start with a minimum of 500 if I'm going to go with a consult and a game plan with a follow-up. All right? P 
publishing has all these other parts. If I have to engage someone like Sue for illustrations, I know, depending upon how many illustrations I'm going to have, and what kind of deal that we need to put together, whether it's things that she can resell and do other things, or if I'm going to own it exclusively, there's all kinds of price tags to that, correct? Yep. So I know that, and, and I have a book I'm doing right now has 22 exclusive illustrations in it. It's not a couple of hundred dollars. It's not a couple, and it's in color. It's not a couple of hundred dollars. So how much money are you going to invest here in that? All right, what's your time commitment? What's the format for you? Okay, so we talk about format. We have print on demand. We have regular printing. We have the book coming along, the video book. You're going to see more of that. You have the A book, the audio book. And what you need to really think about is that publishing is like going into your favorite Italian restaurant. And am I going to have lasagna tonight? Am I going to have spaghetti tonight? Am I going to have the chicken parmigiana tonight? What am I going to have tonight? It's a menu. And when you figure out your audience, for example, I'm going to use healthcare again because it says I know it's a will. But if I'm in California, everybody drives in California. I better have audio. Okay? But if I'm in Iowa, I better have that print book. So you've got to figure out your format. For fiction, you absolutely want to do the strategy with an ebook, and I think everyone should have an ebook. And ebooks are still evolving, especially books that for books that are challenged that have lots of graphics, scientific books. Um, and Tom, you may have some stuff that you're picking up and seeing out, you know, on your future side. But what I'm still not seeing fabulous looking ebooks that have a heavy need for graphics in them. Because on an e-reader, you know you can change your size and your shape and you're moving and everything's around and, and the author's going, that's not how I planned it to look. It's a challenge. It is a challenge. So e-books, I think, are a critical component, but it's not the only component. Now, if I was a fiction writer, I would absolutely seed, start building my platform in e-land. E you can tease, you can throw out chapters, you can start seeing, can I get followers in here? And you, and you start adding, give them free, give them free, give them free, give them free. One of the strategies for those of you who really go into that, the, your free days on Amazon, and Amazon sells 70% of all books, your free days are Monday through Thursday only, only. Heavy buying days is Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Do not do anything free on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, ever on that, because people are out there with their credit cards at that time. Um, so is there a book in you? Which form it is for you? One of the problems, I'm going to give you some numbers here just in a sec, but one of the problems that's coming is, that's happened, is that, you know, we had over a million books published, probably, or over almost three million total with everything this, this last year, but the reality is probably 2.8 should not have come out the gate. And what's happened in Eland is that everybody and their uncle is out there putting it up, and it looks pretty bad. So there's a huge level of garbage. So publishing, I think you want to do with integrity. And you need to know who is on your team. Who do you need on a team? That's a critical area. So one of the things, and I'm going to get into this, why people fail is they don't have an editor. One of the first get-goes that happens. So who's on your team? You need editor, you need designers. Are you going to try to do it yourself? And I'm going to tell you, if you do it yourself, unless this is what you professionally do for a living, it's going to look like you do it yourself. And that's what you get down to the trash heap. OK, so who's on your team? So editing, layout, cover design. Don't do your own covers. Get someone to do it. And remember, if you're starting with Eland, your thumbnail cover has got to really rock and roll. You don't have a lot of detail on it. It's very important to look at in that area. All right, and then it's always important to understand what does success look like to you, okay? What success look like to you? Bob, what success look like to you? Me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, just writing it down. Uh, regarding book, I would say it would be a positive support immediately for the speaking 
that I would do to move the books as well as the speed. Okay, that's success. All right, Daryl, what's success look like to you? Well, there's there's three versions. There's um, three audiences. Um, the the, uh, the main audience is those CEOs of all the support companies. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if they're if they're reading the book, if the book's on their list. Uh -huh. Okay. So that was it. So success is it gets the attention of the executive suite. Companies or, or vacuum pump companies. If those CEOs of those companies have to read this book. Great. So part of his marketing plan should be he should be sending each one a copy for a review. Okay. Brenda, what's success look like to you? Um, just to get the reaction and involvement of the uh, wives of the CEOs and also to maybe entertain at the same time. Okay, so a hawing and entertainment. Tom, what's success look like to you? Uh, our speaking gigs. Speaking gigs, wonderful. Tony, what's success look like to you? Um, well, I just make it comfortable living off my writing. Okay, so financial, yeah. financial. Roger, what would success be? Uh, what would be really a theater for events, uh, workshops, and online programs. Okay. Bella? To have a material impact on the way people think about the world. Fabulous. Linda? Yeah, ultimately, I want to change behavior in your system. Oh, I, I've been trying to do that for 20 years. <laughs> yeah, great. To environment. Environment, okay. Ken? Any hard copies available? So a great calling card, an attractive looking calling card, right? Mm -hmm. And then back of room sales. Perfect. Gail? I don't know yet. Not yet. Okay, still thinking. Carol? Um, I think financial and then also um, making a difference in people's lives through reading what I have to offer. Okay. Educational. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Sue? So awareness, you want a global awareness, all right? Elaine, what's success look like? Success is seeing those teenagers pick up a book and read it. Yep, wonderful. All right, you need to meet Dom Testa. Go to Dom, write this down, domtesta.com, and get familiar with the Big Brain Club and his Galahad series. And success. Um, um, well, let's think of the others. I, I like the financial, but I also like the impact people. Okay. Uh, it's very, yeah. Oh, and Philip. Well, Philip is in, uh, Paul's. Paul's not sure if he's writing a book yet. He's just kind of here. If, if, if I did, I would be to stir up some buzz. Ah, buzz creator. All right. All right. So, could we, you're a shit stirrer. Ah, good. All right. Shit stirrer. All right. So, it's very important to be very clear what success is it monetarily? Is it recognition? Is it being the expert the media calls? What is success? Because that will help you. Sometimes success is just getting it done. I get that too. But be very clear on what your success ratios are in that. So I'm going to give you, take you through a quick journey. Tell me what my timing is. 20 minutes, OK. Quick journey. This is how I started. And my very first book was called The Woman's Guide to Financial Savvy. Um, it started, how it started, it, this was published in June of 1981, St. Martin's Press, New York publisher, well-respected New York publisher, was the bidding winner. Three publishing houses took it. And it was my very first book. This book came from having a dinner, and it sold for $10.95 hardback, 1981. It came from having a dinner. I was a president of a college foundation. And um, one of the perks was that I got to have schmooze and have dinner with the celebrity speakers when they came in. And we were commiserating about our three kids. I had, we both had three teenagers. Mine were a year ahead of his. And I came up with the idea, you know what we ought to do? Um, we ought to take away their cars for a couple of years in lieu of the draft, because mine were talking about, you know, we, he remembers us talking about Vietnam and that kind of thing. And I said, wait, we ought to take away their cars in lieu of the draft. We, we'd save on gasoline. We'd save on insurance. We'd save on lies. We'd save on uh, homework would go up. Study habits would go up. Kids would be home. You know, I, was, I had all these different ideas. And we laughed about it. He went and gave his lecture. And uh, John and I dropped him off at the hotel 
And then I went down to Mexico, where I was there for a week for, for, for some work. And I picked up a copy of the Los Angeles Times, and I'm going through it, and all of a sudden, I see a caricature of a lanky kind of teenager leaning against a gas pump in a car. And all my ideas were in his column. And there was a letter from him when I got back. And it said, I really enjoyed meeting you. And you might look, I might use some of your ideas in a future column. And I'm thinking, future column, dude? This is past tense. And um, hope to see you again. Cheers, Art Bookwald. So that was the cosmic goose for me. And it said, if you don't start taking some of your own ideas, other people will continue to take them. You need to be aware of that. If you've got something unique or a twist with it, so does someone else got that same idea. And they're going to take it and run with it. So procrastinating is not where you want to go. So back then I was in financial planning. I was one of E.F. Hutton's first financial or stockbrokers, women stockbrokers. And I was teaching classes for women on money back in the 70s. Now, so I'm dating myself. But out of this was my class. This book did extraordinarily well, three printings in three weeks. Which then said, Simon & Schuster came back and said, you know, we really did want to work with you. Can we kind of put together another deal? And, well, and so they lured me away, and Money Faces came out. Now, this book is yellowed at this point, but here's the fun thing about this. It's, have you noticed it's still together? This book is 25 years old. Yeah, well, well, it's, you know, but, but you don't have to read it. If you look at books today, they're now up like this. The quality, when you look at the paper, the quality, the glue is still working. You see, publishers today actually cut down on glue because it saves money. The paper is thinner. It's not. The quality of the cover is not as thick. It's very interesting. All right, so this book did okay. It went from hardback to paper, and my editor left the company and went to another company um, and, um, and took me with her. So, and then a group came to me and said, and here is an idea for you to put your books together. You all know the sticky pads and post-its. This little pamphlet, this is a 30-day pamphlet a group came and paid me to do, I did on post-its. Every idea for a day was on a post-it. And then I had, and I've written whole books this way now. I start my major ideas, I use different colors, different sizes. So if I have a story, like when I'm doing my lectures and creating keynotes, uh, workshops and things, I would have the type it, and then my stories, I'd have my key points, I could, could have put it down because I could do an entire day workshop on a post-it pad. That's how good you want to get. The last thing you want to do is sit up with a whole bunch of stuff. And, and you, that, you, I will never let anyone I work with get behind a podium and stay there. You've got to get out there. So this whole little book, you know, this is day 15. So day 15, what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about retirement. And I had to do everything in two pages. You know, that was the format. It all had to be done. That evolved into this. It's still 30 days, but now it's a book book. You know, and I still continued it. So each one started with, here's something to think about. You know, I want to think about. And here's your action plan for the day, and here's my exit, little exit, little teaser to go out with. And it was put together, and this book has had multiple printings and done very, very well. But I've never, you know, totally left money writing money, but it's just not what I do now. So, and you have to look at that. So evolutions on those things. And then I used to work with attorneys all the time, Roger, because I was amazing on figuring out where the money disappeared in the divorce. I could figure out how it walked out the door. So out of that was this book called The Dollars and Cents of Divorce. Phil Donahue, how many of you remember Phil Donahue? Phil Donahue stood in his show and he said, every woman getting married should read this book first. Now, is that an endorsement? Hot. That was hot. And it was a financial book and a how-to, and I knew that this book ended up in divorce court several times with people. So that was very interesting. And we started selling, maybe we should do a brown, brown wrapper or something. Um, with it. 
All right, and then, um, and then another publishing firm came in and then they picked it up and we went to another area, to wholly different format, but yeah, I did the a baker dozen of ideas at the end of every chapter, but it was, I took stuff, start, you learn to plagiarize yourself, it's always a good idea, um, and you take it, and then this book, this is a god-awful looking cover, but it was a great content book, and it led to 10 Smart Money Moves for Women, which won the Colorado Nonfiction Book of the Year. All right, now, this book was a horrible experience for me because I was orphaned with the publisher. I've had three publishers uh, go belly up and orphan me. That means your book's dead. It's dead. It doesn't matter how good it is. That means you're owed money. You know, I've been stiff for over $80,000 in royalties. Okay, you're owed money. But this book, I mean, I didn't like the cover, but it's a great content book. And I then, when I got back the rest of that, I then incorporated some into this book, you know, so that evolved. And then I wrote a kid's book, and this is the book that I ended up publishing 2,000 copies the first get-go of, and when, the, when I got called, we need 1,000 copies. Daryl. Is there a way to protect yourself from that in advance in the contract so, so that um, anybody acquiring those assets, uh, uh, that copyright? You always own the copyright, never give up your copyright. But what you want to do, make sure that if you do publish with someone on the outside, make sure you have a very clear reversions of right contract in there. Make sure that you have an intellectual property attorney. Roger's not the person to talk to on this. You want to talk to an intellectual property attorney um, to look at those kind of contracts because they're always publisher oriented, publisher centric, unless you do it yourself, then you control everything. So that's how you keep control, Daryl, you control it yourself. But if you do it with someone else, because of we're in the electronic age, remember in 1980 when I first started publishing, there was nothing, there, we didn't know what that was. It wasn't born yet. And what happened in, about 10 years ago, Simon & Schuster just blatantly said, hey, if you're with us, you're gonna have to be this way. And basically, you could have said as an author, no, we're not. It's not in my contract. Contract's over. You need to have a reversion of rights contract, a clause in your contract that is very specific and says something like this. If, and, and you have to get it in legalese, but I'm going to give you my verbiage. That if, if, if print sales are less than 300 copies a year, I have the right to terminate the contract and revert all rights to me. Because with print on demand, they can sell one copy a year and keep you in print. And you need to look very closely at these electronic rights and what's going on. I mean, if I had my druthers, I wouldn't give up my electronic rights. If you're going with New York, you're not going to get that chance. This, I mean, if they really want you, you might be able to get it, but it's, it's highly unlikely um, with that deal. Yeah. What? Oh, yes. Well, we have a crook publisher. That's this one. Okay, so this, this was my, one of my breakout books. And is this not the most god-awful cover you've ever seen? You've got these two women who are so unreflective of what the workplace looks like. It's the Gippy Goo receptionist and the gippy goo dental hygienist or whatever you want, I don't, you know, but it's just not reflective. And I finally, and, and blue and red taint my colors either, but we finally got it off. This book was turned down by every publisher. We went with a very small press because I knew it was a breakout. This book was based on my dissertation on why women undermine other women. I knew it was a breakout book. People actually said to me, there is no way you'll get any attention, there's no publicity. No, and my very favorite rejection letter was rejection number 28, and I knew the book was coming out because we went with a very small press. Because I knew, because I didn't know how to do what I know now. I didn't know how to do it. So I went with a very small press who only offered a few thousand dollars in advance, where I was looking for a hundred thousand dollars in an advance. Only a few thousand because I knew I had to get it out. And um, the last letter said, you know, there's going to be, there's no marketing, there's no publicity value, blah, 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 blah. And I sent them a letter and said, I just, I thought I'd let you know that I'll be on Oprah next week on this book. Okay. And by the way, Oprah did not sell books. Just the book club. She really didn't sell that many books. 
on that. But it did land a four-page spread in People magazine. It did end up in Time. It did end in the Wall Street Journal multiple times. All right, then I finally got them to remove the women, and they went with that. But then look at all the publicity that was starting to land, you know, as you, as you can go around here. So we had a lot of that. Then fabulous Linda Tripp came along, and Monica Lewinsky and Bill Clinton. All right, that re-kicked the whole thing. And then I got to do, I did another survey. I've done nine surveys nationally on this now. So I did this, and then they kind of did a more contemporary cover and brought it out that way. So we had that, and then it evolved this, and then by, and, and in the middle, what, what, what the genesis of this book was, Women in Sabotage, is I went through an embezzlement where I lost a million dollars. A female partner stole the money. Okay, so I was trying to figure out how in the hell did this happen? I'm not stupid. It had everything to do with women relationships, over trusting, giving people another chance, all those things. On the woman and woman, is that all free? Is that the same book with different uh, editions? No, this this is same book. Yeah. These two, this is a new book, and it took me a long time to convince the tattered cover it was a new book. With the same name. Yeah. Well, it's but it's it's woman to woman 2000. Yeah. Okay, we changed that around. All right, because of the embezzlement, this book happened called The Confidence Factor. And The Confidence Factor came, and, and what I'm trying to show you is books breed. Once you get going on this path, books have the capability of breeding, and it doesn't have to be in a series. Other things, like Tom has a, a zillion ideas a, a minute, other things will come up, but he has to have, because of his futurist position, he has got to have at least one book that ties into that, that brings him in as this global expert. Then he can go and do all this other stuff on it. So Bristol Myers came to me, and I became one of their spokespersons. And by the time the deal was done, it was worth about a quarter of a million dollars. It included writing this book. These were Carrie Hand Lotion's colors at the time. I became their national spokesperson for three years. They underwrote speaking gigs. They bought 25,000 copies of the book. They gave them away. They were involved, and, and then that took an interesting turn too. But then there was the paper version, and then when it was over, I took everything back, and I created a new book, smaller, thinner, um, that became a corporate mainstay in leadership, okay, confidence factor. And out of that, I did another study, and this is, this is the offspring called Gender Traps. Now, this was not a great experience, McGraw-Hill. They did nothing, and they became kind of crooky too, because they, after I took the rights back, they still continued to sell books and sell rights. And they sold foreign rights without my permission, nor did they give me any money. And I found that out by accident. But when I knew, when I did the study and thought the top 10 traps for women in the workplace, I knew that this one was a book in itself. Because number nine was I sabotage myself. And I always knew there's a book in this. So I saved all the stories from the interviews. And this book, I don't even speak on it when I was speaking. But people would come by and they would touch the cover and they would say, that's me. And we sold thousands of them. See? So it's having that title. And then along the line, healthcare surfaced. And um, several directors of nursing heard me speak about why women shaft other women. Remember, we're down in the woman to woman stage. So this book evolved called The Browse Report on Women in Healthcare, which was the first study I did on healthcare. And the results were an oh my god experience for us. Okay. So then, that evolved to zapping conflict in the healthcare workplace. And then this was the second edition of it. And that's had multiple copies. And the latest in that series, which has been the hot one, is called Stabotage. How to deal with the pit bull skunks, snakes, scorpions, and slugs in the healthcare workplace. And if you work in healthcare, you know what this means, right? The book, the cover sells the book. And if they're not sure, are saboteurs in your midst? Are there bullies in your workplace? Do you have to deal with pit bulls with lipstick? Has anyone intentionally undermined you? By the third bullet, the book is sold. Okay? And we've sold 
thousands and thousands. So we're going to get into titles with that today um, on that. So that's just kind of a run through. So what did success look like to you? Be clear. Some it's money, some it's recognition, some it's positioning, some it's having a product to sell and be available. Some of it's just, <laughs> I need, I did it. All right, be clear on that. All right, so here's some numbers. 2009 introduced 1,052,803 book titles published. This is academic included in the process. Traditional was 288,000, that's out of New York, 355. And the non-traditional, that would be in the self-published arena, all the different self-published, was 764,448. Now, the trends starting really aggressively in 2009, and this is when the internet came along, is the U.S. title output decreased by 3.2%, but the self and the independent markets went up by 132%. And this is what Amazon has done. And so people who piss and moan about Amazon, Amazon is really your ally. It is a bookstore. You need to understand that. It is a bookstore. It's just a cyber bookstore. Now, publishing in 2002, and uh, only only 10 books sold over a million copies. That would be like Harry Potter, okay? Only 10 books. The average book sale of a New York published author is between 500 and 1,000 books total. That means when we get into the dollar and cents today, you ma you're making nothing. You're making nothing. You can have a vacation maybe. You're making nothing. 211 versus 210, now look at these numbers. 211,269 was published in the self-independent market versus 133,000. Now, what does this come from? If you look up here, this is this my little, yeah. Okay, so up in here, where it says ISBN, we'll talk about ISBN, but the ISBN, that's what this represents. People who have gone to Bowker, B-O-W-K-E-R is where you get your ISBNs. They own them. Um, ISBNs, the self market, this was uh, they, that we had in 2010, 133,000. So I just told you a million books were published. And, this, and that 700,000 marker, only 133,000 had an ISBN. That means a bookstore is not carrying your book. Now, if your goal, by the way, no one said success to them is going down to Barnes and Noble and see my book. No one said going down, success is going down to Tattered Cover and do a bookstore signing. All right, so it's changed. We have door number one. So what's door number one out there? That's traditional New York publishing. If you're going to do traditional publishing, that means your book idea, if they buy it, you're looking at, or, or they'll say, we'll do it, but, you know, or maybe you're going to pay them to do it, which is what they're after now. Um, and I'm going to talk about predators when we come back after our break. But traditional is going to take you roughly 18 months in the path. So if you have a topical book, a political book, a book that is so timely, if it doesn't get out here in the next six months, you can't go this route. Be very clear on that. All right, do door number two is the self-published market. All right, the self-published market is different from the small press independent market. The self-published market is that you go down to right now, Bob is doing self-publishing. He's going down and printing one at a time really on that. Now, Tom is more, Tom, you're doing, you're printing yours just a couple at a time right now. You're doing print on demand? Yeah, we're going to 50 to 100. 50 to 100. So he's more into the small, well, he, you're moving into the small press. So at some point, you might want to think bigger here. If you can really move them. Okay, and Frederick Printing, which is CGX, they specialize in doing this, the onesie and twosie um, type of thing. But self-published market is where most of the crap ends up. And you can tell a self-published book pretty much about the way the cover looks, about the contact. You can tell about the layout. You can tell, you can tell on that. Now, there are a lot of very successful self-published books who get started this route and then transition into a small press or they go into what we call offset printing, bigger runs, and they start moving them at a time. I, right now, I don't buy anything less than 1,000 books at a crack. All right, so, and then publishing predators. You need, no, well, let's see, are we time? Okay, so let me talk about publishing predators. If you look at Ex Libris, Publish America, 
Author Solutions, Author House. Now here's what's happened. This, this is really awful. Um, and Author Solutions is the biggest of the self-publishing area. And people say, well, I'm being published by Author House, Author Solutions. They also own Ex Libris and I Universe. Right. Now, what they say is, I've got a publisher. No, you don't. You pay them to publish your book. That's a pay to publish. You need to understand anybody you get involved in, in publishing, you must go to Google and put in the word the name, and then you put complaint in behind it. You put in problem behind it, you put in scam behind it. You're looking for problems. You will see people talking awful about that. And we, I have had to do more contract undoing, getting people out of contracts um, with them than anything. But here's what's happened. Well established houses like Hay House, how many of you heard of Hay House in Louise Hay? Well known inspirational market. They have created a stealth partnership with Author Solutions and they created this thing called Balboa Press. Thomas Nelson created a stealth partnership and created West Bow. So people think they get the publishing days in their eyes and people think, oh, Louise Hay will see my book. Oh my God, it's going to be so exciting. And what happens is they don't realize, whoops, what did I do? Okay. They don't realize they're really dealing with foster solutions, which means basically whoever you're dealing with probably will be gone next week. Because the turnover is so unbelievable in the process. All right, let's take a 10 minute break, and then we'll come back and, and dig deep.